gentlemen, please welcome your host, Mr. Sidney Brownwood. Hello, good evening, and welcome to this, the latest Lardy Oddcast, as once again we're back in the Lard Island studio talking to the ant and deck of Wargaming, Rich and Nick. Gentlemen, welcome back to the Oddcast. Fair right, Which one's Ant and which one's Nick? Who's in rehab this week? <laughs> Maybe both. But without further ado, chaps, um, I've just got three words for you both. What a tanker. Ooh, what a tanker indeed. Yeah, well, we've been what a tanker um, Ing. obsessed of late, haven't we, really? It's been a really frantic month for Water Tanker. So I can't remember when we last did the podcast, but um, since then, of course, Water Tanker has, has uh, been published and is out for sale, and the response has been phenomenal, uh, really. It's really always quite a nerve wracking moment when you take a rule set and you release it to the world and you say to people, There you go, what do you think of that? Um, but the response has absolutely blown our socks off. It's, um, you know, I, a few weeks ago when it first came out, I was on Twitter one night mm. and everything that came through on my feed was people playing Water Tanker, mm. which was, mm. you know, astounding. Mm. I don't think I've known a, a launch like it in, in the rules that we've had. Have you? No, definitely not. And I think one of the key things there is, is the, well, it's a low, uh, low threshold to access most of us have got tanks, yeah, that's so um, exactly. uh, you know, unlike with sharp practice where you think, hey, what would I like to do? I'd like to do Garibaldi, or I'd like to do Maximilian, or I'd like to do Napoleonics, and then you you draw up your army lists, and then order your figures, and then you get this lull of about a month while people are frantically painting before they get it on the table. <laughs> with what a tanker, I've got tanks, yeah. <laughs> and, and most of us have. So a lot of people were able to get that game pretty much... I mean, some people were playing that game the day we released it, um, which is which is great to see, yeah. Yeah, so mm -hmm. it's, uh, it, it's, it's kind of um, really re-energised me, actually, in, mm. in some regards, because... Uh, uh, it's been really quite nice to hear the feedback that 99.99% mm. of people have had about the game, which is, yeah. which is fab, mm. really good. Yeah, I mean, I, I must admit, it's got me, um, uh, it's it's got me buying tanks, painting 15 mil tanks. We've just started, mm -hmm. um, just started a campaign. We're looking at uh, putting together a campaign system for the rules, and we played the first couple of games at the club on. Tuesday night, mm -hmm. uh, some really interesting games in the desert in 1942 with um, a troop of Hunnies up against a platoon of Panzer Twos, and uh, just some great fun, really interesting and with some ideas in there about adding in things like force morale and we're also looking at putting things in like anti-tank guns, you know, infantry holding, you know, holding ground and so on and so forth, all of which can influence the way you're going to run your, your tanker games but no it's it's been really positive and i think one of the things that i've been most pleased to see and funnily enough we saw this the very first time we took the rules out when we played at panath is young people coming up yeah, and playing yeah. and the number of young people you're seeing online who were playing with their with their dads or their mums and dads i mean there's a guy up in um, stevenage who i uh, saw was online yesterday playing with two of his daughters and their boyfriend, and you think, well, that's you know, these are probably people who, who have never played, possibly never played a war game before, and you think that's that's absolutely fabulous that this is, this is becoming a portal, for which hopefully youngsters are going to be infused by, and um, uh, and you know maybe pick up pick up the hobby. Everybody talks about the growing hobby. We've talked about it before. I've always said I'm not convinced by it. And again, one of the smashing things at Salute was the number of youngsters who were there playing that game. Um, one of the guys on social media sent me a message the next day. He said, even though even though my nephew got blown up and completely you know, destroyed, he just spent the rest of the trip talking about what a great time he'd had with the rules. Yeah, which, that's um, great, isn't it? That's great. It really does... Um, it, it really does re-energise you, the word, the word Nick used, it really does make you think, great, I'm really pleased that we've created something here that um, that's um, that not only is being enjoyed by your veterans or grognards um, around, uh, around the world, but it's also uh, an introductory point for youngsters. And I'm really interested to see the way that different people are playing it. So some people are playing mm. very fast and loose, loads mm. of fun, mm. great entry-level game, for example, mm. that to play on the dining room table. 
and mm. others are going down the historical route for yeah. it and playing it in that yeah. way. And actually, what we're doing with the campaigns that we're working yeah. on now is very much is very much putting that historical emphasis on it. It's kind of mm. uh, yeah, it, it kind of works both ways, and it's really mm. interesting to see mm. the way that people have adopted it and, and play with it, and the scales that people are playing it in. Yeah. So we've got. Um, uh, our friend Mark Backhouse is tweeting pictures of, of him yeah. playing it in six millimeter mm. on a uh, doormat. On the oh. doormat, you know, <laughs> yeah. refighting, the, yeah. refighting the battle for Northern France in, yeah. the, in his yeah. kitchen. Um, and then you've got other guys I see on social media who are mm. playing it in mm. one sixteenth scale. Wow! With some monster tanks in in what can only be described as a model village set up in their back garden. <laughs> right. uh, you know. Amazing, right. really amazing stuff, and everything in between seems to work. I mean, I've been doing mm. my own solo games in fifteen mil. Uh, is that because you got no friends? It is, yeah. Basically, <laughs> it was because I'm locked in here most of the time. <laughs> but I've been in the panic room at Lard Island, yeah. uh, playing some games on my own, mm. playing with myself as you do when everybody else is out, and 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 that's just part of the fun. So um... <laughs> follow that. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well, I, should, I, I should also, actually, before, <laughs> or ignore it. Yeah, no, before we go on, actually, I, well, I need to do a shout out to Jay Arnold, the veteran wargamer, oh, yeah. who, who yeah. actually has been um, playing games live mm. uh, on YouTube. I yeah. mean, from, from, from our perspective in the UK, he seems to play them in the middle of the night. Um, That's because the world is round. <laughs> and uh, uh, yeah. but, um, you know, all cute. he's picked up the game, he's playing with his mates, mm. and, he, and he's really showing how you can play games mm. over the internet as well. Which is yeah, not so yeah I think that's been a great development. I mean, mm. I, you know, I was obviously at Salute mm. as well, and I was uh, I was really impressed by not just how many people were keen to play it, people mm. were talking about it all the time when I was walking around, um, but how many young people, were, yeah, young kids were playing, and mm. people who are new to the hobby were playing, never played before. So it's always great to see. It's, uh, it's good that it's developing and really interesting to see where you take it next. Well, we're very much responding to what we hear and what we see about the way people are playing it. Yeah. Um, so we made conscious decisions during the development of the game that mm. we weren't going to include infantry, we weren't going to include armoured cars because we wanted to keep it mm. as a very simple, mm. a very you know, simple to play game. Mm. Um, and, but listening to the feedback from people, you know, we, we are... We're responding, and we're going to be supporting it through mm. articles in the specials, mm. in the Chris, in the summer special that yeah. we've got coming up. Well, I certainly think that the the campaign rules, uh, which we're going to have a you know a, a supplement of the similar to at the sharp end, is going to be a great opportunity to say this is how you you can uh, play a campaign, and while you're doing it, this is how you can add in infantry, this is how you can add in anti tank guns and things like that. So that. That that will be great. And the other thing is, uh, you know, one of the things we've decided to do is we're going to we're getting a set of cards um, produced um, because, <laughs> funnily enough, when we looked at it, we thought, well, let's just produce a set of rules where cards and tokens, I don't know, twenty five quid or whatever it is, where people um, can just pick these up cheaply. It's a great cheap game to play. Go it because we, as we've said, they've already got the tanks, so we'll just keep it cheap and cheerful. We're not trying trying to, um, you know, make. Um, make it more complicated than it is, but people have started saying, "Oh, um, wouldn't it be nice to have some cards?" So we we responded to that, and we're getting those produced. So it'll be good to get them. People will be able to use them, and I think um, we've got our first uh, campaign games day that we're going to in Bristol next weekend yeah. at uh, Bristol Independent Gamers, yeah. uh, which should be a fabulous fun day of uh, all day tanking. And I think, I think one of the things that uh, if you're working mm. on the campaign system, then that's going to be perfect for those sort of day games where people can sort of take those ideas across the course mm. of a day and they can use a campaign system to do that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, I, for that. that's right. I, I think that's right. And we also know that actually from Chain of Command is that mm. people like um, to play games that are connected. Mm. So what this will enable you to do is, very much in the same way that At, a sharp, uh, mm. at the Sharp End works for Chain of Command, uh, whatever we will produce for what mm. tanker will will handle that same um, what goes on in between the actions and yeah. you know, how the actions structured and what's the mm. ladder yeah. uh, that these battles are fought over that kind of thing. Mm. Yeah, I think people enjoy that a lot. So I can see that it's been a fantastically busy time uh, for you both on Lard Island with the release of What a Tanker. So have you had any time to do anything else? And uh, that's a good way of introducing our next segment, which is of course. What's in the workshop? Oh, what's in the workshop?
So we've just got through the uh, rather intense security doors um, onto Lord Island Complex Level Number Fourteen, which is of course where our Don't workshop. Don't you know? No, no, no. <laughs> They're not going to get down here. It's taken us a good five hours to get down here. Yeah. But here we are, finally in the workshop, uh, and it's a good point for me to ask you both, chaps. What's in the workshop? What have you been working on? <laughs> Who's first? Well, I can go first Nick. because mine's relatively easy because I've been doing nothing really <laughs> apart from <laughs> apart from keeping up with what a tanker. Um, no. So uh, your workshop bench is looking very work, very empty. Well, I, 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 interestingly, um, I've got lots of ideas that have been kicked off through what a tanker, and we're working on, as we mentioned, the latest, you know, newest developments of that. But my own workbench has been uh, fairly quiet. I've reorganised my uh, gaming cupboard, if you like. I've got two or three cupboards. And I thought I had my lead mounting into a workable pile of just one box. And uh, so I packed it into one box and I thought, this is it now. It's all there. That's great. And then, of course, I opened another cupboard and there's another bloody great pile of stuff that you've forgotten all about. <laughs> so um, I've been mainly trying to work out and organise that. Um, and... I haven't done much else really apart from that. So mine's my work. Mm. That's me. You've done on the work on the workbench. Mm. Well, my uh, my lead mountain is about the size of a one nine cubic yard skip. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and so what did I do? I added more stuff to it. I, w I went out. I bought uh, I bought three um, units of tanks each for water tanker. I decided to do nineteen forty two in the desert. Um, because you can get some lovely tanks there. So for the Germans, I started out with Panzer II Fs, which then go up into uh, early, early-ish um, 37 mil Panzer Threes, and then up to a short barrel Panzer IV. And for the British, I did the Hunnies, and the, which goes up to Crusader Threes with a six pounder gun, mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. then on to Grants. Um, so I bought a load of them and I'm kind of halfway through painting them all up and I got Flames of War models there. Um, first time I've ever used the plastic models from them. I don't know why I, well I do know why I got them actually because I've got them on eBay. Um, I just went on eBay, had a bit of a search around and what came up were Flames of War stuff. I'm very impressed putting them together. The level of detail mm. and the way the figures fit together, uh, yeah, the nice. models fit together, really, really impressed. Yeah. Um, they look nice as well. Mm, they, look good. they do look okay. I mean, I must admit, I, I have found that with my eyesight, I can't really paint 15 mil uh, mm. men that well anymore. So whereas I used to do lots of facial detail and things like that, I, um, I just went pink blob, that'll do. Um, but uh, <laughs> but the good thing about not being able to see to paint is that when they're on the table, you also can't see to that degree of detail, so they look fine to me, and that's all that matters. So that's that. More importantly, I have been working very hard on the 1940 handbook for Chain of Command. That is really coming together now. I've got all the lists done for the Belgians, for the Dutch, um, for the Danes, uh, for the French, and I'm just finishing off with the Germans. Uh, obviously, I've done the British. Um, I I kind of got diverted, and I was thinking about including the Norway campaign in there as well. However, the Norway campaign is so unique; you've got such unusual units in there that I thought it would be better to do that as a standalone supplement, and then you can really take into account that the. the the terrain of Norway, and even put in a pint-sized campaign or two, maybe fighting up the Good Brands Dahl or uh, fighting around Narvik. That type of thing could be handled better as a standalone supplement in its own right. Um, but I'm currently at the point now of just doing the layout for for that handbook. So uh, I'm also for that. I've also been building some tanks. So I got some beautiful Blitzkrieg miniatures, Panzer twos and Panzer threes. Um, they're and 148, aren't they? they no, these are 156. Okay, I've decided. They do, they do both ranges. They do. I, for my late war tanks, I've gone 150th because most of my stuff is metal cordy, which yeah. I really yeah. like. But for early war stuff, I kind of like the dinky smaller size. So 156, um, and I'm really pleased with those. They're, they're beautiful models, the Blitzkrieg models. I've also got a. Uh, some Warlord Shah B1B, uh, Bis Platoon, uh, and I've got some H30, 
uh, R35s, mm. I've got some Panzer 38Ts, so mm. I've got quite a lot of early war armour and I'm painting up um, some units of uh, Belgians, I'm painting up some units of uh, French Chasseurs Portais, which are the uh, the Panzer Grenadier, if you like, infantry mm. that accompany the Cuirassier divisions, which are the real punch, uh, that's where the, the Char Bs come in. Um, so that's great. Um, It'll be good. It uh, will be good. Um, really nice. That's going to be great fun. Um, and I intend to take that game round some of the shows this year, which oh, is yeah. uh, which should should be nice to play. And I really want to do some big chain of command with that as well. I've got quite a lot of Germans painted up now. I've got two whole platoons of infantry, a platoon of pioneers, and that's going to allow us to do some really fun games with you know trying to destroy bridges, seize bridges or whatever, and some quite nice games where you've got um, allied cooperation or lack of cooperation, so you might have the British holding a canal line with some Frenchmen in support, French tanks, French anti-tank guns, whatever, which, which will just be really interesting to play. So, very, very busy time, the handbooks are really coming together now, I've, uh, it made me realise how much... Um, there's two ways you can go about this when you're writing a handbook. You can just trot out the same old stuff, or you can really start at the beginning and re-research it. And in the end, I did start at the beginning and re-research an awful lot of this stuff, even though we've covered this ground before, and I'm pleased I did, because it's kind of given me a much better appreciation of exactly what they're doing at, at bottom level. You know, just things like Chasseur Ardennes, everybody talks about them as being an elite unit. Well, you know, once I start reading the accounts in, in French, you find out that they'd done no tactical training at all for about nine months because all they were doing were um, setting charges so they could blow up bridges. Their role was not to, to delay the Germans by fighting them to a standstill, but by doing an awful lot of demolition. And some of the scenarios that I read about there are where they do actually get involved in a fight because they're trying to carry out this demolition are really quite interesting. But anyway, we've got an awful lot of different unit types that people can be using uh, for the different nations, I mean, I think generally it's about 10 lists per nation. Um, so all with different support lists depending on what type of division they're coming from. So that should be fun and we're, we're just putting together all the scenarios in that as well. So I've been mad busy whilst he's sitting on his backside looking at social media. Well, we're looking mm. at social media mm. and, and playing some solo water tanker as I said. Yeah, yeah. Just being, I've had my 15mm yeah. out and uh, been playing been playing with those and it's been mm. great fun actually to it's a great scale to do it in you know um but it yeah so, so with chain command then mm. with that when do you reckon that's going to be out if i if i dare mm. ask that question if i know that it's what the listeners mm. yeah want yeah to know the answer to well it's going to be going to the printer i would hope within a month so it's probably two months away so it's going to be a hard copy yeah it's going to be hard copy yeah, yeah it's going to be hard copy it's going to have a bit of background history, a few maps. So I've just been doing the maps earlier on today for the Dutch to show how their defences were put together. So if you want to play Dutch, you've got the map of Holland. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, it, you, you know, you, you can gain an appreciation and understanding what it's about. For the Belgians, you'll have a map of Belgium. For the French, a map of France. So you've got a bit of background history. You'll have the army lists for each nation. You'll have scenarios for each nation. And you'll have the armories. You'll have national characteristics. You'll have all the stats for all the weapons and, you know, different units. For, exa for example, Chasseur Ardennes, they know the area they're fighting in like the back of their hand. Yeah. So they, they start the game off with a, chain of, a full chain of command dice that they can use. Mm -hmm. So it's just little things yes. that allow you to represent different units. Things like using the force morale table. Well, we've always had this thing that we, we, once you get to four, you can, you, you'll lose a dice. Well, for a, for a second line uh, unit, it may be that we want to treat them as regulars, but actually we want to see them fall away in effectiveness a bit earlier. Mm -hmm. So it may be that when their force morale gets down to as high as six or seven, they start losing command dice at different times yeah. and in different ways. Mm -hmm. And I think that will allow people to really... Um, get a lot of feel for the flavour of the different types of units, which I, I'm, I'm excited about. It's always attractive, isn't it, when you're mm. playing a war game, when you've got you know, troops of comparable abilities, mm. skills, and complementary 
yeah. um, tactics. Yeah, it sort of makes for a lot of flavour. And I think that that 1940 mm. campaign is really one of those where that comes to the fore. It's hugely interesting because, you know, once you get into 1941, 1942, you, you, you're looking at troops who've had experience of war. Well, slightly seasoned by Yeah, that's right. Or they've been knocked out of the war. Or they've, or they've gone. <laughs> yeah, they've lost, yeah. Um, but uh, when you're looking at 1940, the different ways that the armies trained their troops, the different yeah. structures that they had, mm. you know, pretty much, um, you know, all, all the Belgian army were, were reservists who'd just been in for a limited training. The only regulars that the Dutch had were the um, Marines, and they were uh, they were shipped out to the Dutch East Indies to um, to run the show out there. So different ways, different units are structured and put together will mean that they fight in a different way. And also, though, for the if you're playing Northwest Europe, 1944, if you're playing yeah. British and German, yeah. it's not a case of rolling back the same units because they're different structures and different makeup in 1944. Yeah, totally, yeah. So it's quite interesting yeah, yeah. if you're used to playing mm, 1944 yeah, yeah, yeah. and you go to play 1940, mm. you realise what's yeah, war. you realise that there's mm. a, it's a different fight going on now. Oh, it is, and the uh, uh, you know just you know the Germans in 1944 have got big management control problems because yeah. they don't have enough senior leaders in 1940. Well, they're full of vim, but but equally they don't have a, a lot of their units don't even have basic equipment like the 50 mm mortar. Um, so so all types of different units are represented in there, and they've all got their own nuances and differences, which is which is fun. Fun. What about you, Sydney? Um, well, I. I haven't been doing as much as Richard, but I might have done more than you, mate, uh, but not by much. So I finished my stuff for my 2 mil Nordlingen game, which will mm -hmm. bring to the cover sometime. Mm -hmm. Remember, we did Lutzen, so I've done the yeah. Yeah, Spanish for Nordlingen, uh, and also the Weimarians, and they will be great on the table. So again, two slightly different armies um, taking part in the Thirty Years' War. This is 16. Will we notice 34. the difference when we look at them in 2 mil? Uh, you, 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 you will not notice the difference in 2 mil. You will notice the difference of the Spanish later Tercios, because they look slightly... Uh, I've done them slightly differently to the Imperial um, Brigade formations. Weimarians? Um, uh, yeah, mm. Bernard of Saxe Weimar, one of the principal, oh, right. one oh, of the principal um, sort of French yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Protestant commanders. Right. So yeah. he'll be interesting, leading a mainly mercenary army. Oh, uh, so oh. you're, you're Sounds like my wife. <laughs> so you'll notice the difference, hopefully, in the game, but you won't mm. notice the difference in 2 mil because they're 2 mil. Um, and I've also been battling with um, getting some 28 mil French hussars from 1688 to stain their horses. I bought these at Salute, and I won't mention the manufacturer, but the horses weren't great. So I've been casting around with some of our mates to uh, try and find some new horses for those guys. You've been rustling. I've been rustling up. Yes. <laughs> I've been rustling up horses from all over the place. But I think that they will be a really interesting um, uh, unit to use. I've done the Spanish now. The Spanish are done. Uh, I've done the Imperials, so we're doing the French now, so hopefully, maybe by the end of the year, we'll be able to have a game of that. Who yeah. knows? Um, well, thanks for that, mm -hmm. gentlemen. That's all very good. Let's now get past the security doors again, go up the 15 flights of stairs or whatever it is, back, to the, back to the studio. <laughs> My God. <laughs> it's time we did some exercise, guys. Yeah. Um, I'm now starting to worry. <laughs> I know that we've got a very big issue waiting for us in the studio as our reward. Ooh. Okay, this way, guys. Right, welcome back. <laughs> welcome back to the sofa of contemplation. I can see one or two, one or two sort of red faces <laughs> and uh, slightly hoarse, wheezy noises coming from uh, the population of Lard Island as we take get up those stairs. But while you um, sit down, guys, on the sofa of contemplation, <laughs> let me read out an email that we've had from a very old friend of Lard and very good friend of ours, a celebrity podcaster. The Welsh Rizard himself, mm. Mr. Mike Hobbs. So Mike says, and this is taken directly from Mike's email. Love the show. I thought I'd weigh in with a question for you all. When I was young, I fell in love. I fell in love with wargaming. Back then, when the world was young and I was virile and full of joy, the hobby was dominated by companies that either produced rules or produced models. Now, we've largely seen a marriage between these two areas. Most rule sets are written to complement a range of miniatures. Even so, there are still plenty of companies who produce figures that are rules agnostic. 
but the number of pure rules producers seems to be on the decline. One would have thought that the advance in desktop publishing would have seen an increase in this area, making self-publishing rules easier than before. Maybe it's a case that rules are being produced, but we don't get to see them due to the bigger war games companies dominating the market, with one of their one-stop shop of rules and figures. As you are one of the few companies that produce rules and support material for games alone, do you think that this business model is something that is sustainable in the future? Or are you a last ditch resistance to progress? A throwback to the olden times, maybe. Neathandrals in a world of Homo sapiens? The cheeky girls of 2018? Still here, but only just? Well, that was Mike's wonderful email. Thank you so much, Mike. Um, and I can only ask Richard now to give me your thoughts on Mike's fantastic email. Well, um, I think one of the things um, that is key from that is his saying that, you know, with, te with the technology that we've all got at home these days, with a computer on our desk or, you know, a Mac or whatever, PC, Mac, producing a set of rules that look really great is indeed much easier any of us with a little bit of you know a little bit of help or you know effort could produce something that looks pretty good but the problem is that um, because the hobby has changed in the last 10 15 years to uh, where we're, where our expectations are very much for full color rule sets um, it's very, very difficult for um, people writing a set of rules to, to then actually publish them. Um, and I'll give you an example. When we when we published, um, uh, you know, Sharp Practice, or when we published Chain of Command, or when we published Water Tanker, you are looking at front end costs of tens of thousands yeah. of pounds. And I don't mean ten thousands of pounds. I mean twenty to thirty thousand pounds if you include things like the Sharp Practice cards or the 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 tokens. Um, I mean just simply buying the envelopes um, to post out the initial orders of Water Tanker cost over two thousand quid, and that's just envelopes which most most people don't even you know. Don't don't even contemplate as being part of the of the, the costs. Um, so whilst it is easier for us definitely to to draw something up on the computer, we, we are in a in a very lucky position that you know we've been around writing rule sets for for 15 years, um, and you know we've got um, quite a lot of people like what we do, understand what we do, and we get quite a lot of people involved in that playtest process. So a lot of people have seen some kind of sight of what we're doing. And so that when we get when we do go to press with um, with a, a, a new set of rules, it's nice to think that we've got a lot of loyal customers out there who are eagerly anticipating those. Even so, it's a risk every time, and it's the type of risk that it you can only it can only go wrong once. <laughs> because if you chuck thirty grand at a project and you don't sell those rules, that's game over. I'm afraid for for you know most uh, businesses and for a, for a, for an individual who doesn't have a fifteen year track record of relationships with with um, customers um, it makes things very very difficult indeed because um, you, you people really aren't sure what any product is going to be about and it's all very well saying hey I've got a new set of rules for the Napoleonic period but what they'll say is well there's you know there's dozens of rule sets out there for that period already um, uh, so <laughs> I think because technology allows us to do something, it doesn't make it any easier ultimately because uh, it's it's the, the entry level cost. 25 years ago, the entry level cost was all you had to buy was a long arm stapler and have access to the works photocopier, and you could go in and rattle out a set, a set of rules at the weekend <coughs> when, the, when the boss wasn't looking. But these days, that that's simply not acceptable because we all have greater expectations. Um, about what a set of rules should look like. Um, so I think there's a real issue there in terms of the reason why we are not seeing more companies doing it. It's not because the companies that were doing it are necessarily dying out. Uh, although obviously uh, you know you you have seen companies like WRG which were very very active 25 years ago, 20 years ago, 15 years ago. You know the guys who were at the helm of that organisation 
you know, because of their age, have tended to be producing less stuff these days. Companies like Newbury Rules have obviously disappeared, but I mean, we really are going back into the depths of history there. Um, but I think one of the reasons that we don't see more companies doing it is not that, that um, companies have died out, it's just that the, the opportunities don't present themselves. They're not so easy to, it's not so easy to pick up and run with. Um, I don't know, um, are we Neanderthals in a world of Homo sapiens? I, I like to think not. There's a certain attraction, isn't there, for new entrants to the hobby or hobbyists mm. who've been around for some time. When they're thinking about doing a new period, mm. things can be very easy if there's a set of figures which are available and the manufacturer of the figures produces the rules, possibly the t terrain as well. It does make things easy for people to sort of pick up to, um, and when you get a bit of a word of mouth or a buzz about a game, it's easy for people to move into that because they would feel that everything is on hand. Um, some of the decisions might have been made, but that's compromise. And the benefit of that compromise is that you're able to buy a whole game. If not in a single box, then certainly mm. you know, a mm. programmed purchase uh, over a course of a couple of months, say. Um, is that the way that we think that the war games hobby is increasingly going to be going? I think wonder if that's what Mike's thinking of with, with that question as to um, is everything going to be packaged? Are there still is there still the room for a flexible, sort of proactive, nimble sort of company who just writes rules to compete with a bit more of a juggernaut, perhaps? Mm, well, I, th I think. Um the word experience comes to mind. People like to buy an experience. Okay. So if they can buy the game in its entirety and have a great game <coughs> from whatever's in that box, then they're going to buy that experience and they're going to like that. Mm. Um, however, I don't. I, I think there's room beyond that in the hobby. I think people will buy figures. I think they'll like to play. It might be that it comes in a box with its own set of rules, um, but sometimes they don't, might not like those rules. And there's always room for stuff around the edges to mm. pick up on on that um, so I don't think it's going to go entirely down that route I think the entry level to games is quite low we've seen that you know continually entry level point for gaming games getting smaller and smaller um, but people like the experience of the game and what goes with that I think uh, picking up on something you said about you know an opportunity for picking up crumbs around the edges, although that's I'm paraphrasing yeah. you there. I certainly don't see us as a company who are picking up crumbs around the edges yeah. of you know the large um, corporate organisations with us as a small body. I mean, we we produce an awful lot of rule sets. I mean, you only have to to look at the fact that chain of command. You know, we've had. Um, 24,000 sets of that. Uh, the first version of Sharp Practice we sold over 30,000 sets of that. I mean these are not small um, numbers of rule sets that, that are being sold. I mean uh, I think it's important to say that um, uh, we specialise in creating rule sets. Um, we are looking to develop rules that um, enable people to enjoy playing a period and have a particular experience. Um, we like the fact that our rules are very, um, almost you know, steeped in history, soaked in history if you like, but at the same time you don't need a history degree to be able to play them. We, we focus very much, because all we're doing is developing a set of rules, we are focusing very much on making sure that yeah. that one product, that one component, uh, is as good as it possibly can be. And I think when you look at what you need to play a war game, um, you need figures, you need terrain, and you're you know potentially going to be spending an awful lot of money on those things. So you know you may find yourself if you're totally re-equipping your table with with terrain, spending hundreds of pounds on that. If you're buying your armies from you, you're going to spend hundreds of pounds on that. But the one component that really determines whether that game is any fun is the the set of rules that you use to play that game. You can have a very pretty game uh, with with nice figures and nice terrain, but if the rules are awful, or well, um, then that's going to be a disappointing experience. However, conversely, if the rules are really good and allow you to get the experience you want from uh, from that game, then that's where it becomes a fabulous um, experience. 
it's not just a game, it becomes more than that, it becomes an experience. And I have to say, being totally honest with you, I've seen a lot of organisations, particularly on Kickstarters, funnily enough, and I don't know why this is, where they've gone to market with some super figures saying, look at this, this is going to be great, we're producing this great range of figures, maybe they're producing a range of terrain to go with it as well, and they say it, and we've got the rules for it. But when those games come to fruition, on a number of occasions, I've seen people say, well, I'm not going to play them because I'm really disappointed with the rules. Now, I think it's very, very easy when you're, when you're focusing on trying to produce everything for a game to maybe miss a trick because you're, you're focusing on getting the figures produced and because figures are the major cost component, mm. um, that that's what you really focus on getting right because you you know psychologically you're focusing on the big cost bit <coughs> and rules almost seem to be an incidental well our belief is that rules aren't an incidental our belief is that rules are absolutely key to to enjoying the hobby and consequently we focus on that bit because let's face it I mean, there's quite a few World War II ranges of figures out there. Some are liked, some are don't. And I don't want to have to tell anybody, you must play this game with the set of figures that I prescribe. I want yeah. people to be able to go out there and choose the figures that they enjoy playing with. It's like, what a tanker. We intentionally made it scale neutral so that people can play with whatever scale they want, whatever scale they maybe they've already got. Um, and I think that that's... That, that's positive for people who are playing the game because in that instance they're probably using collections they've already got mm. um, but in other instances you get a choice to buy the figures that you like so you don't have to use those figures that you bought salute with dodgy horses you can buy another range of figures <laughs> yeah and and also yeah. there's <coughs> excuse me sorry mm. um, but the, you know you can get the figures you can you can buy them you can play them but in terms of the rules I'm looking at this through, uh, uh, I know, from a particular angle, but actually, we know that rules can drive figure sales. If you get a great rule set that creates a good experience, yeah. people want to buy more. So a small scale, for instance, I'd say some of the stuff I've seen lately, so people who enjoy a water tanker, mm. even you don't need Southbridge, you're going out and buying new tanks. You spend, mm. Gamers will spend, I don't know, 20, 25 quid on a set of rules, and then they'll go out and they'll spend 200, 400 quid yeah. on figures to go with that game that they've now created yeah. and they'll do that from a range of suppliers yeah. so I think rules and, and, and the flow of independent rules into the marketplace is really important because I think it drives sales of existing figure ranges now mm. there's another side of that is I don't think you can create a set of rules where mm. there are no figures to game with mm. so you know you can't write a set of rules for a war that nobody sells toys for because you're kind of wasting your time mm. um, but actually it, when, when the two come together which well, when good sets of rules support good sets of figures, I think you can really get some energy behind those games and people enjoy playing those. Mm. And I think what one of the things that, that we are able to do is, is create some of that um, energy, I hope. I think that's certainly true, that just the hobby evolves you know, over mm. time. Yeah. And I think one of the things, that, with a parallel to the role-playing hobby, you know, uh, 15 years ago, people would say, well, Wizards of the Coast would... You know, be one of those big sort of companies like Paizo, one of these are huge companies producing, you know, very very well known uh, sets of role playing games. But the independent role playing game designers have really had a field day in the last five to ten years, as people who are familiar with playing games want a different experience. They want something different. They want a companies or producers or people in the, you know, the, the back sheds to sort of produce something which is differently focused, um, and that becomes the unique point relating to that particular game and I think yeah hopefully in time we'll see that war gaming as well that those independent rules writers will come back to the fore I agree with what you say Rich about the fact that it's become very much legitimate that you know rules have been become full colour and they've become perfectly bound I think that's slightly a shame I mean don't get me wrong I think what we do what you do relating to the public publication of rules um, is fantastic you know they look really really nice and they're beautifully glossy but I think that having a vibrant rule producing community which is independent from figures is only for the good that's only going to make the strong the mm. hobby stronger yeah. and I think one of the things that you know even if you buy a packaged box of terrain and figures and rules together mm. 
after you've played those rules, you're always going to want to experiment. You're going to want to see what other people think about that campaign, what other people have, uh, how they've treated the particular tactics of the time, or how they've dealt with the sort of the idiosyncrasies of the commanders of that period. And it's natural that once you've got your figures, you're going to experiment and buy different rule sets. You're not always mm. going to be wanting to expand the figure collection, but you're going to want to create maybe the same battle with different sets of rules. I've done that, and that's always an interesting experience. But just di having different flavours relating to the games you play with, with the core figures that yeah. you have. Yeah. And I think <coughs> with those things mm. in mind, it can be a really vibrant sort of experience to sort of try different rule sets. Mm. So going back to Mike's question, I think, no, I don't think it is the case that... Um, the role of the independent figure producer, designer, um, publisher, I don't think that's finished at all. I think that in the future we're hopefully going to see more of that than just this situation which you know is, is fine as long as it stands of figure manufacturers and rules uh, and um, and rules writing going together in a packaged product. Mm. I think one of the things that I always talk about is the fact that um, uh, the there's two ways to appeal to there's two ways to appeal to your to your customers and that these come from very very opposite ends of the spectrum you either attempt to develop a product which is going to appeal to as many people as possibly can uh, by being interesting and uh, exciting and doing something clever uh, or you attempt to appeal to as many people as possible by being as uh, inoffensive as possible. Now, the, the, I always talk about this with breweries. That I, I used to work for a brewery many years ago. I had a pub and uh, they had lost the recipe for the best bitter uh, for, that, for that, uh, that brewery. In the, when keg beer came in in the 60s, they literally threw away the old records. And when they wanted to bring back the brewery's best bitter, they decided to brew 10 different brews and then they would present them to this sort of crowd of sort of drinkers whose faces had launched a thousand pints and um, they they put the, the beers in front of these uh, these hardened drinkers and they started off saying which one tastes in your recollection tastes as much like the old best bitter of the 1950s and 60s and then as the day went on they tried. They decided that what they actually wanted to find was the bitter that was the least offensive, that would not upset anybody. So in the end, they ended up producing an extremely bland product, just simply so it didn't offend anybody. And one of the things that we we certainly feel strongly about is the fact that um, we don't want to be that producing that bland product mm. in order to in order to limit the number of people who dislike our rules we want to start at the other end and produce the most exciting and interesting and challenging product that we can in order to appeal to the broadest number of people yeah. now i think there is definitely a drive in the hobby to head for more s simple rules so simplifying the way the mechanisms work so they're not clunky and heavy and they're not tedious to play through but the the important thing there is to make the rules simple to play but ensure that they're still packed with decisions for the gamers to make um, and that in that way what you do is you produce a set of rules which allows the gamer to focus on making those command decisions and there's lots and lots of command decisions. So with what a tanker, for example, there's lots of different ways that you can use that dice configuration. And how you choose to play that really influences the way your tank performs. Yeah. In chain of command, you've got a similar reaction with the, the, the command dice. You can't do everything you want. So what am I going to do to um, make the experience? What, what am I going to do to make the... Uh, the decisions that's going to best allow me to to get the best possible result I can with what uh, what limit within the limitations that I'm presented with, and I think that's the type of thing that makes for an interesting game experience. And I think it's when we're not having to write rules in order to sell particular products, yeah. we have a lot more freedom mm. to be a bit more daring and to be a little bit more cutting edge if you like whereas when you're trying to sell as many products as possible you know you you you've got other imperatives 
So but I think it's a question of which one of those imperatives drives, mm -hmm. isn't it? So with us, the game experience, the focus that we want to put onto the game yeah. is the most important thing. So we will focus on the game at a certain level, um, which, you know, if you were working with a figure manufacturer, it might actually not be to their to their liking. Mm -hmm. We've had conversations in the past where people have approached about could we write a game to go with yeah, some yeah. ranges, etc. Um, you know, but actually we might focus at the game at a certain level, which means that they will actually not sell the full range of figures because you know, we might have, a, well, in a World War Two example, like yeah. what you're going to say is, mm. yeah, you, we, we might have an infantry section on the table, we probably wouldn't also have a section of 25 pounder artillery pieces on the, no, table, no. On the same table. No. Um, whereas of course if you're selling the whole range of toys, mm. you might quite like to be able to do that. Well, you're, this is, this is the, the big sigmoid curve argument which a number of rule sets use, mm. which says, okay, I want to have the, I want to have the um, artillery on the table. Um, well, realistically, the artillery would be represented on the table with a with a you know forward observation officer, mm. and he would have his telephone or his radio. But uh, but if you're looking to uh, if you're looking to sell um, <coughs> if you're looking to sell those those twenty five pounder guns, well, you don't really want to limit it to that because you want to you want to flog them. Well, we're not we're not in the market for for selling ranges of figures. So we're quite happy to just go with the two-man forward observer team. So there's a different imperative there. I mean, the, 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 a good analogy, I think, is the when you talk about the game in a box where everything there is, all the components are there, is looking at all-inclusive holidays. And I went on one of these, um, I went on one of these uh, last year, and I thought it was really interesting that I was on the, the coast in a beautiful part of Menorca, and... I spent the whole holiday um, recognizing the fact that whilst this uh, this is apparently a great idea because you are uh, you are getting everything all found everything found you paid for everything I found myself thinking well hold on a minute literally 50 yards away 100 yards away there were some fantastic tapas restaurants um, which were not included and I couldn't get that experience in the all inclusive hotel um, it was rather strange, actually. You'd have leg of lamb with and and and, and, um, and spaghetti hoops and things. It, the, nothing quite went <laughs> together. <laughs> so no, I said, to, I said to my wife, well, look, we, we might have paid for this all-inclusive holiday, but I'm not going to do it because I want to get something bigger than the deal that's in the box. It could be that you love spaghetti hoops and leg of lamb, and that's fine. If you do, then stay there. But I said, I want to get out there and experience, you know, the real restaurants where people are talking to me in Spanish and I've got to make an effort and I've got to choose from that menu and I'm going to have that seafood that is fresh, that's been landed on that quay this morning, not the stuff that has arrived in the chilled delivery wagon and has, was caught last week. And in order to get that real experience... Um, I decided that it was better to not go for the product that I was presented with neatly in a box, but to actually strike out and find something more exciting, more interesting. And that's kind of where I see us. We're a tapas restaurant. Mm. So, so that ties back into, <coughs> for me, uh, that com when, when I said, you, well, the word you used earlier was crumbs. Yeah. So I think the important thing for independent rules designers is that if you recognise that people are going all inclusive and you have your own tapas bar, yeah. Your tapas bar has to be one of two things. It either has to be really close mm. to the entrance to the all inclusive so that when mm. people do come outside, they can see you and they can mm. come to you and they can have a great experience. Or you have to build a reputation that's good enough for them to make the journey specially to find you. Well, so I think, you have to have one of those two. Yeah, I think savvy rules writers who are not mm. linked with uh, figure manufacturers have have done that and I think you've done that and you know we don't you don't produce photocopy sheets of paper with staples on you produce beautiful products uh, which are similar to the products produced by companies who also have figure ranges but also publishers like Sam Mustafa with mm. Rommel, mm. Blue Shirt, mm. Longstreet, Maurice, yeah. fantastic rules, mm. um, beautiful produced cards and really intelligent rule sets which focus on something different to move, shoot, melee, morale mm. Yeah. Um, uh, also, to the strongest, and now for King and Parliament, another set of very good mm. rules which are also independent, yeah, yeah. but yeah. using a gridded system. Yeah. Something that possibly we felt we felt might not be used for a long, long time in wargaming mm. since the sort of seventies. Mm. Rommel shares that as well, mm. and these are both 
close in product in production quality and like your rules mm. to you know what a large company can produce when i say large i mean the sort of rules writing mm. with figures but also they stand on their own reputation over a period of time of being played and tested and enjoyed by by uh, by many companies and i think that you know with Sam Staffer's rules and also your rules and other independent rules like that, they combine that flavour of being independent, of being flexible, focusing on something which they like and have really looked at in detail, but they're also accessible and they make good games. And I think one of the things that you touched on, Richard, is the fact that it's sometimes difficult if you're making that investment, that huge investment in figures, in terrain, in... Uh, you know, all of the, the moulds and the you know, cab design for sort of the figures. Mm -hmm. If you're making all of that, you can't afford to lose that investment. So your rules have to be, to some extent, yeah, able to attract the widest possible audience. Yeah, I very much doubt that you know, yeah. when we've produced some of the rules, we've really been thinking about you know, the widest audience. But what we want to produce is a really great set of figures. I'm sure Sam Mustafa would have produced yeah. Rommel in 6mm. It wasn't really thinking that mm. you know, I necessarily want to go for a skirmish 25mm scale. Mm. And it's a decision which I'm sure that you make as a rules designer mm. that you don't want to just to compromise what benefits you get from being independent just to sort of rival and do something to mirror somebody else. So there is a degree that you want to be close to the restaurant, to use that analogy, mm. but you don't want to be absolutely in the, the sort of oh, no, foyer. You've, you've got to, you've you've got got to be off something different. It's got to be a different experience. Yeah. And it has to be. But that isn't about... Um, frankly, I don't think that is about us trying to having to shift what we offer to make sure our experience is different to the, no. the uh, game-in-the-box experience, because I honestly believe it's the independence... Uh, uh, product producers who are at, who are at uh, who are in the business of producing something that is that's vibrant and exciting and, and new, um, and whereas an awful lot of times with products that are boxed, you often find they are mimicking products that have been successful previously, um, and because they say, well, look, we're, we're following the same model, we know people like that style of game, therefore we're going to stick with that style of game. When we sit down and design any new set of rules, we don't say let's base it on this because we know this has been successful. And I think that's, that hopefully is what, to answer Mike's question, means that we are going to be relevant in the hobby, and other independent rule producers as well are going to be re relevant in the hobby for a long time in the future because we are producing games which provide people with an enhanced tapas experience rather than the canteen style dinner um, that they're getting in the all-inclusive hotel. So I think that's probably answered Mike's question uh, in full and has given us a, a great insight into fantastic Spanish cooking and tapas which we can yeah. deal with in detail on another podcast. I, so I didn't like the cheeky girls analogy. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> we'll pick that up with Mike yeah. of course but before we get distracted by cheeky girls and by tapas, we should really wander down the landing to the Lard Island Library, uh, where I'm looking forward to hearing about what's been on your reading lists mm. since the last show. Good. So, let me ask Nick first, uh, what are your book choices for this podcast? Well, we've had a bit of a tanking theme, haven't we? <laughs> Certainly, of late, I felt we've had a tanking theme. So, um, I've looked mainly at tanker books this time round and um, mm. well there's certainly lots of them in the library yeah. um, and yeah. so it's quite yeah. hard to get these down but I think between us we've got some really good choices here um, at various different levels as well because mm. you, can, it's, it's, you can go into as much detail with this as you want. Now once you go into any kind of warfare that's <coughs> about mechanical things mm. um, you can very easily go into the technical library and pick out books that will tell you all the intricate details about how the rivets are put onto the top turret of a yeah. Panzer II. The imperatives uh, there are of ballistics. Of books that. And, and, a lot of, and actually, a lot of the books, a lot of the very good books actually do that in great detail. Um, the tough thing sometimes with tank books is trying to find the balance about how much of it is about the technical detail of what you want to mm. tank mm. and how much of it is about the way it was fought and, and, and the human beings the in and the metal box. how much of it is about the, yeah, about yeah. the people and the experience of fighting them. 
So we've kind of got, I've got some books here anyway that kind of, um, I think, talk to each of those level, uh, and, and at different kind of entry points in terms of cost as well. So the first book I'm going to mention really, really quickly um, is one that you can buy in just about any bookshop on the high street. It's one of these kind of pocket manuals that they put together for, you can get it for a nine pound in Waterstones or something. So that's a pretty entry level thing. It's called the Tank Commander. It's put together from um, using pamphlets of the time around organisations and tactics uh, and how tanks were used, etc. So it's one of these books that's using the pamphlets of the time, recreated these days, mushed together. Yeah. So got a bit of bit of American training mm. manual, a bit mm. of British training manual in mm. there about how tanks are used. It's got various chapters on tactics, uh, mm. how the tanks are operated, how they moved, <coughs> how they deployed, things a commander should be using, what you should have in your bivouac sack, that kind of thing. Um, so there's some interesting diagrams it's in got some tank uh, As I looked at it before, it's got some great deployment pictures mm. with, that give details of platoons and companies. I thought it was a really great book when I flipped through it before. I mean, that's, well, who, uh, who publishes that, Sydney? Um, this is by Poole of London, mm. and the Tank Commander Pocket Manual, 1939 to 1945, edited by R. Shepherd. I think probably on my blog I put the books on from last time, and mm. I'll put mm. these on again. Put, and what, now what I say about that book is it's not going to be in the right level of detail for lots of uh, mm. hardcore gamers. Um, but if you just want to pick up something that's an easy read to look at on the train, mm. yeah, uh, then yeah. that's the kind of thing to go to. Um, but really, I think that I'm going to focus on two other books which kind of look at the war and different aspects of it that, are, mm. that appeal to me at the moment. Now, um, you said about the Western Desert campaign yeah. that we're going to be going into and I have a great book to support that mm. which is um, Tank Combat in North Africa, The Opening Rounds. It's by Thomas Gents, J-E-N-T-Z and it contains details of the Operation Sonnenblum, Brevity, Scorpion and Battle Axe between February and June 1941 and it really is uh, an excellent book to go through. It's quite a large sort of coffee table format I guess you would say. Um, I can't actually tell off the top of my head how much it is but I can tell you that you can get it on Amazon. Um, and it covers all the aspects of tank warfare that you would expect it to be looking at. So for instance there's uh, charts here about regimental formations and formations used to move <coughs> up to the line and troop formations of line ahead, one up, two up, for allied and Axis forces. So it covers both perspectives on the actions. It right. talks about the campaigns. It also talks, if you're really interested in this kind of stuff, about the muzzle velocities of the two-pounded gun and the percentage of shots you might expect to get on target, etc, etc. So for instance, did you know that if you were moving, um, according to the British two-pounder gunnery trials in 1938, two-pounder gun, if you were moving at 10 miles an hour, you might fire 19 rounds and get four hits, uh, and therefore that's 21% of your hits might be on target. Sounds like my Did dice you know rolling. Exactly. <laughs> So it's got lots of, if you're really into that kind of detailed stuff, mm. uh, then it's, it's got for those details. For budding independent yeah. writers, this but is for one For anybody who really, really um, struggles to make friends, there's lots of detail <laughs> here about some, about some of the tiny, tiny aspects yeah. of uh, intricacies of how a tank is put together. And notice your now, book is well thumbed. Yeah, yeah. People yeah, struggling to make, to, to make friends. Why do you read that bit? Well, <laughs> you have to understand that before you can get onto the rest of it, don't you? Um, and then it talks about the actual operations themselves, gives tactical analysis on the battle, talks yeah. about preliminary moves uh, around the campaign, has maps of the campaign, has really good detailed accounts of actions that, were, that take uh, place in that campaign, talks about uh, the strengths of the relative squadrons that are involved. So these are tank battles. So it's giving us lots of good detail that we will use as part of our Western Desert campaign. Mm. And there are... Um, individual accounts of actions and some absolutely cracking photos. It's great photos. As well. yeah. So uh, this is this book is it's by Schiffer, a Schiffer military history book. As I say, it's Tank Combat in North Africa, the opening rounds by Thomas uh, Jens. So that's very much a focus on the campaign. Right. And then if I can indulge um, mm -hmm. for one more book, I thought it was mm -hmm. important to look at the human aspects of uh, what's going on inside these tanks because that's a massive oh. part 
of, of where we direct our energy. Absolutely towards. right. We, I, I have had two or three emails from people complaining to me that the ballistics were not as they felt that they should be, and my response really is that these rules are about the experience of the tank crews in the tanks and it is a game which is designed to be enjoyable and played for fun and really if you focus entirely on ballistics you are missing out on what was happening with the people who were fighting in that vehicle where it's noisy and it's smelly and talking to each other is difficult and seeing what's going on outside the tank is even harder and that is so important that we focus on that with a tank game just as much as we do with with uh, uh, the experience of the men that we cover in chain of command and sharp practice and all our other games so um, there are a few books that actually look at this so the, the books for instance by um, Ken Tout who talks about um, going into action as part of the British Tank Corps uh, a really really good books to look at for that so yep so we've got um, a Fine Night for Tanks, The mm. Road to Falaise by mm. Kent Out. Mm. There's The Bloody Battle for Tilly, mm. Normandy 1944 by mm. Kent Out. There's, of course, the classic book Tank, uh, 40 mm. Hours of Battle, August 1944, yeah. which is also by Kent. So there are lots mm. of first hand stories. And people stories. like Stuart Hills with his yeah. My Tank into Normandy, yeah. which I can see on the shelf over there at the moment. And, the, and, and the, one of the other ones mm. I nearly mm. chose was the. Um, mm. The book Tankers in Tunisia, which is an American book, which yeah, is interviewing, yeah, yeah. interviewing American mm. tankers after mm. their first experience of fighting against the Axis forces in, in uh, North Africa. Yeah. And that's got some really good learning about their first um, mm. yeah. exposure to tank combat. But the one I've gone for is Tank mm. Men, the human story of tanks at war by Robert Kershaw. Um, it's published by Hodder and it's a thick paperback book. Um, that I think I picked up at the bookshop at uh, the Imperial War Museum, Duxford, uh, right. a year or so ago. Mark Urban wrote an excellent book about tanks, mm. and uh, its name escapes me. Well, Sydney, I'm going to have to ask you to add that on. I've got it somewhere over there on the bookshelves, but uh, that doesn't necessarily mean I can spot it at this moment in time, but really good book. But Tank Men, <coughs> by Kershaw, um, takes experience of tank warfare, and he talks about it through the different campaigns. So he's talking about actions on the Russian front, the Western Desert, mm. Normandy, what it's like to be selected as a tanker in the first place. Um, so there's things in there about the how the Blitzkrieg was right. It's a really nice, good paperback book, holiday reading for mm. sure. Mm. Good. Sid, what about you, mate? Well, I, my four books, um, very much of a similar vein, but I went for the Great War. Um, mm. And I think that the tank experiences in the Great War are... <coughs> interesting because they are written about from the accounts of the people at the time as being predominantly human experiences and not technical experiences yeah. and that's because tanks were obviously unknown they were just being invented and the tank core was in the uh, British <coughs> tank core was very much uh, a place at which um, entrepreneurial individuals could join or people uh, soldiers would be sent from their units when they weren't good at anything else and some two, 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 <laughs> bit like you joining us here. Yeah. <laughs> two of the best, two of the best books I thought were uh, *Band of Brigands* by Christy Campbell, which is a fantastic, oh, yeah, accessible yeah, 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 book yeah. about the formation and the um, experiences of the tank war. Even mm. better, I think, is *Tank Action in the Great War* by Ian Verinder, which takes mm. um, B Company of the Tank Corps uh, through all of its campaigns, and it's an absolutely fantastic book. Uh, really culminating in the actions around Cambrai and taken lots and lots of um, interviews with family members, uh, with individuals who are in the Tank Corps um, and looking at their experiences uh, being within the tanks themselves. There's a, a longer book called The Tanks at Fleurs in two volumes by Trevor Pigeon which is absolutely great if you're recreating tank actions and we used um, a number of the maps from that book in some of the specials, and I think <coughs> Stout Hearts and Iron Troopers, one of the modern blood scenarios. Mm -hmm. uh, he really focused on uh, the experiences of the tanks on the Somme um, in a really granular, minute detail uh, with some very, very uh, detailed maps there. And another excellent book 
which I found was uh, by Captain Hickey called Rolling Into Action, which was published in 1927. This was the best out of the post-war descriptions of British tanks, um, and it's an exper a personal experience of you know, being a tank commander in a tank in the Great War, mm. and that was really good. There's also um, a good American book about tank experience in the First World War, which I'll try and put on list, and there's a good one on, in French as well, which I've also, which I didn't bring with me actually, I can't remember the name of it. So we'll put those on the blog as well, and uh, all of those four which I've mentioned, really strongly recommended for me. But the, my favourite is Tank Action: The Great War by Ian Verinder, a really superb book. It's a really interesting things as well about the use of the tanks in the in the Palestine campaign at the Gaza mm. battles, mm. where, I mean, can you imagine being in one of those first World War tanks in, mm. that kind of, mm. yeah. in that kind of climate and environment, yeah. where they just become artillery magnets? Yeah. Mm. Um, mm. Very yeah. interesting uh, use, you know, the way they were used. Well, one thing we should say, and that's uh, just reminded me of that, is that we're talking about <coughs> tank books and experiences and reading about that. There is nothing like going to the tank museum at Bovingdon and actually getting into a tank. Oh, and I yeah, remember yeah. the experience that I had with one of our <coughs> mates for the board game club, Panda, we went into, I think it was probably a Mark a Mark V, and just to actually get into the tank mm. um, and move around in the tank was quite amazing, you know, to actually think of the noise and the difficulty of getting out uh, of a male Mark V tank in the Great War, you know, extraordinarily difficult. Um, but actually having that, you know, visceral experience of being inside a tank, I mean, that's that nothing really makes one appreciate the sort of bravery of people on all sides. Um, just being within a tank is actually doing that. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. And of course, what I like about your selection is that they're all completely irrelevant for what a tanker because uh, <laughs> not that many, unless you want to refight the single tank <laughs> tank action of the Great War numerous times. Well, in the fashion of being truly independent, <laughs> um, I would hate. Just to be uh, choosing books because they fitted in with the rules. Oh, <laughs> right, good. Well, funnily enough, talking of choosing books, I couldn't remember Mark Urban's book, but it was called Tank War, um, which was a really interesting book. And funnily enough, I took it on my all-inclusive holiday. <laughs> and uh, 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 But it didn't accompany me to the tapas restaurant. Um, but it, uh, it focuses on the 5th Royal Tank Regiment, the 5 RTR, from France 1940 all the way to Hamburg in 1945 mm. and it talks about the way that the regiment develops and the crews within it develop and how they're commanded and you know their, their successes and failures, their ups and downs. Really, really uh, interesting book. However, my choice of book actually isn't about tanks, um, although it could be a bit. Um, I as part of my research for the Chain of Command 1940 handbook, uh, I've been reading loads of books, and one of the ones that I've uh, really enjoyed the most to get an overall big picture is James Holland's The War in the West, uh, The Rise of Germany, uh, which has been great. And one of the things that I enjoyed about that was its uh, coverage of Rommel in North Africa. Because it was interesting that uh, whilst the book's called The War in the West, it, it kind of actually covers the Western you know, operational theatre, and that includes North Africa. It was really interesting to hear that um, whilst we all sort of venerate Rommel as being this fabulous general, um, he was actually considered at the time during the um, uh, period in 1941 um, by his superiors, they were concerned that he'd actually gone insane. Uh, because he was apparently zooming about all over the desert mm. and using up supplies that he simply uh, didn't have um, <clears throat> didn't have any ways of replacing, and th there was a point where they they literally thought that he'd become unstable, and I thought, well, that's really interesting. You know, people don't normally knock the Rommel story, and at the same time, um, naval and military press have just had recently had a sale. Um, where there was an opportunity to pick up some really interesting books for really quite cheaply. And one of the books that I noticed there was called Rommel, A Reappraisal, edited by Ian, a chap called Ian Beckett. And it's actually a series of um, um, essays, effectively, written by about half a dozen different um, <coughs> contrib contributors, where they look at the life and career of Rommel, and they basically reassess and reappraise his 
uh, how what he actually achieved stacks up to the Rommel legend. One of the things I feel very strongly about history is that um, the word revisionist in history is sometimes viewed as being a wonderful thing and at other times viewed as being a terrible thing depending who's reading it. But I think, to be honest with you, if any history book is not revisionist, you wonder maybe why it, it is being written at all, if it, it, all it's doing is simply um, repeating stuff that has already been said. However, um, you also, with any revisionist history, have to take it with a, a pinch of salt because you've got to make your own mind up as to whether what the whether the arguments being presented are uh, worthwhile listening to or not. Uh, however, I think this book's interesting because it does dare to question a guy who, of course, was a very successful Panzer commander with seven Panzer division in France in 1940 and then went on to uh, command at a higher level. Um, and uh, I'm not going to say uh, what, whether I agree with what the book says, because that would mean telling you what the book says, but it's a book well worth a read, if only on the basis that uh, it's going to make you think about what you thought you knew, yeah. and I think mm. that that That's is good. part of the job of any good, well-written book covering any aspect of history. So, there we go, Rommel, Reappraisal, edited by Ian Beckett, published by Pen and Sword, um, price on the inside, 20 quid or 19.99. I picked it up in the Naval and Military Press sale for £3.50, which is um, less than the price of a pint. It is, and also worth saying that the James Holland book yeah. is, I, I know, is available on Audible, so it's one of these, it's an audio book, it's well worth Getting your hands yeah, on. yeah, I certainly. Audible is kind of um, something that, once again, is demonstrative of how we consume things in a different fashion. You know, mm. we all used to buy books, read them, and mm. uh, and then draw our own conclusions from it. The fact that now, whilst walking the dog, I am able to listen to, you know, books that I need to read um, is is a fantastic opportunity. I will say that Audible has a relatively um, <clears throat> Uh, not limited range because there's a lot of choice in there but the books in there are probably the books that you would expect to see yeah, um, uh, you know in your public library as opposed to the one that I've just mentioned which is a lot more about um, You're absolutely right, uh, yeah. analysis but they if do you allow you to you know you can be on the motorway and digest the book at the same time which you, with a hard copy is not recommended you can uh, <laughs> I mean I, I'm actually I'm actually listening at the moment to um, book called Why France Collapsed by Guy Chapman, and I'm not sure how old it is, but they mention milliards of of dollars. Now nobody's mentioned milliards for an awful long time, so it um, I reckon it was written in either the 50s or 60s. Yeah. But it's a very very interesting analysis from that period of time of why it was felt that the French army hadn't performed as people thought it would do in the second world war and to be as i say to be able to listen to that while i'm driving up to yeah. you know down to bristol next weekend or up to durham last weekend mm. or just while i'm walking uh, the dog around the block is a great opportunity to uh, to utilize time effectively and i think if, if mm. you're into tanks there are so many books that we haven't mentioned you know brazen chariots which is a classic text about um the experience of tank warfare yeah. Didn't, you know, didn't make it to the mm. didn't make it to this particular shortlist. Although and you have to say that if you want to understand tank warfare, it's a great book to read. Yeah, yeah. So there are yeah. loads and loads of great books on tanks. And mm. I think the more you read, the more you realise actually we can we can apply these to games in in terms of what we learn for chain of command and also in water tanker and, and just get more out of our history in terms of understanding the way that tanks are fought. But there is always a shortlist, and unfortunately, yeah. some books that make the cut. And also, we have to cut it short tonight, guys, no. because that's no. all we've got time for. And I just need to mm. say thank you to Nick and Rich for joining me tonight. Thanks very much to all of you at home for listening. Please keep your emails and letters coming in with any questions you might have, in particular, any big issues that you want discussed. And finally, we've just got time for me to hand you over to Roger and the band, as we say, a big good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Into
tonight's show, Sydney Randall is joined by Nick Skinner and Richard Clark with music by Roger Barraclough and his band. <laughs> 